وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد. We begin by praising Allah. We praise Him. We seek His help, and we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Anyone whom Allah guides, no one can misguide. But anybody whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of being worshipped. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. So today I have been given a very controversial topic. Alhamdulillah. You know, I always get the controversial topics. And then I get in trouble afterwards. But I'm, I, inshallah, I hope this will not cause any trouble. But what I do hope, my brothers and sisters, what it will do is cause us to think. It will cause us to think. One of the things, one of the things, one of the objectives of being a Muslim, one of the things or one of the characteristics, I should say, that we, we should acquire as Muslims, that we should have as Muslims, is the characteristic of thoughtfulness. We should be self-reflecting, deep-thinking people. It's very important, brothers and sisters, that you develop, that you develop, and you, it's not something that happens instantly. It takes years. It takes patience. It takes perseverance. It takes humility to be able to make an honest assessment of yourself. So being self-aware, being aware about ourselves, why we do things, what motivates us, having that self-awareness is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the deen of Islam wants us to develop within ourselves. One of the most obvious evidences of this is the saying of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily, and you all know this, I'm sure you all know this. Definitely, verily, most certainly, every action is judged by its intention. And every and the hadith goes on to say the meaning of which is and everybody gets what they intended. So if your hijrah was for Allah and His Messenger, then you will get what you intended. But if your hijrah was for marriage or for, for some other worldly purpose, then your action is for what you intended. Now this hadith. This saying of the Prophet the context of this saying of the Prophet was that there was a certain man who wanted to get married to a certain woman of Medina and he said, and this was the time of Hijrah, so he, he said, I will go to Medina and get married and I will make Hijrah. And so this is the context of what this, what this hadith was revealed. Now it's very interesting, brothers and sisters, that the actual physicality of the action of this man is exactly the same. He left Mecca, he left his home, he left his family, 
He traveled 250 miles, all the hardship, and he went to live in another town. The actual physical action is exactly the same. If you do it for marriage, or you do it for the deed, the physicality of the action, the actual physical thing that you go through is the same as if you went from Mecca to Medina because you are persecuted in Mecca and you want to go and live in a place where you are more free to practice your religion. The actual physical movement is the same. So what is the difference between the action of the first man and the action of the one who makes it for the sake of Allah? What is the only real difference? The difference is intention. It's intention. And this is the case, brothers and sisters, for everything you do. Everything you do, everything. You get up and think about your day. I want you to think about your day. Yeah? You get up in the morning, the ladies, you start to prepare nasa lamak. This, by the way, is the best breakfast in the world. I know Sheikh, but Dr. Muhammad Salah, he, he doesn't agree with him. I, you know, poor, poor man, you know. But, you know, I said, Sheikh, I tell you what, I love this breakfast so much, I learned to cook it, and I cook it at home. Yeah. I, I love Nasai Lamak, so I had for breakfast Nasai Lamak. MashaAllah. What, and anyway, I'm getting carried away. It's not a lecture about Nasai Lamak. So, I, so, but think about it now. What is your need? Why are you making this breakfast? Is it just habit? Is it because if you don't do it, your husband will say certain things to you or treat you in a certain way? What is your niya, sisters? Brothers, you get up, you go to work, you eat the nasalamak. You go to work. What is your niya? What's your intention? In everything that you do, when you eat, when you sleep, when you talk, when you greet, when you meet, when you drive, when you work, when you sleep, in Islam, if you have the right niya, even eating nasa lamak can be something Allah will reward you with. Even sleeping will be something that Allah can reward you with. This is an amazing hadith. The, 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 the Prophet wasallam said that a man will get rewarded for having intimate relations with his wife. He said, we get rewarded for that, Ya Rasulullah? He said, yes. If you did it in a haram way, would you not be punished? Even this, there is reward depending on your niyyah. Therefore you have to understand, brothers and sisters, can you imagine how you have to be thinking about yourself and your motivations the whole time? You should be self-reflective. And that means you need to understand yourself. You need to know what motivates you. You need to know what controls you. I, I just finished a really interesting book. And this book was on self-control. And what was interesting is this book was written from a scientific perspective. It was not, you know, a, a book of suluq or spirituality or tasawwuf. It was a scientific book written by a non-Muslim who, who believes in the theory of evolution, doesn't believe in, you know, Allah or... So it, it is a book written purely from a secular scientific point of view. But the, the, the key theme of this book is the same thing. And what was very interesting about this book is one of the things that she was talking about is how easily we are influenced without thinking about what goes on around us. So we are very easily influenced by our environment. And a lot of the time, brothers and sisters, you think you are making choices, but you are not making choices. You are being manipulated into doing things that certain people want you to do. Even right now, 
I'm manipulating you. It's true. The way that I talk, the words that I choose, the expressions that I use, the tone of my voice is all intended to make you feel and react to certain things. This is the reality. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he, he mentioned that there is magic in speech. There is magic in speech. The speech of people can make you do amazing good things and unfortunately also terrible things as well. And I was just talking to Dr. Muhammad Salah this morning. And he's talking about how the treatment that he and some scholars would get in Egypt, how people would flock them, almost nearly kill them, just trying to give salams and showing their love and affection. But it's all emotion. Because the moment things start going a bit crazy, and you know things in Egypt started going a bit crazy, then suddenly things change. Lots of emotion. Not a lot of knowledge. And that's how most of us are, because we're not self-reflective. The Sahaba, on the other hand, one of the things we find mentioned about the Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them, was they, they would never be taken in by the sweetness and the power of a person's speech. They would never be taken in by it. Even the scholars, uh, even the students, excuse me, of Imam Shafi. It's a famous incident when they came to him and they said, Ya Sheikh, we think we understand what you're teaching us now. So they said, he said, go, go ahead, tell me. He said, if we find a man walking on the water, we will not believe what he says until we first examine what is his aqidah, what is his belief. He said, no, you are wrong. You made it too small. He said, even if you see him flying in the air, don't believe what he says until you check what is his aqidah. How many people will be fooled by a dajjal How many people will be taken in by a dajjal By Masih al dajjal How many people? How many Muslims even will follow him? His fitna is so great. His fitna is so great. People will be fooled. He will come to a man, a Bedouin. He said, believe, he said, believe in me that I am your, your Rabb. He says, no. He said, what if I bring your brother and father to life? Will you then believe I am the Rabb, that I have resurrected them? He said, if you can do that, I will believe. And he will do it. But it will not be his brother and his father. It will be two jinn who will take the form of his brother and father. But because he's ignorant, and he's taken in, manipulating, he will end up following him. And this is the thing, brothers and sisters, we are being manipulated all the time. Especially now I want to talk about culture. Because although I suspect that you're thinking I'm going to talk about, you know, Malaysian culture and does Malaysian culture correspond to Islam? This is, maybe we will talk about that. But what I want to do is first I want to talk about global culture. You see, in reality, I think that unfortunately many of us, we are 20 years behind. Yes, I could give you a talk about the conflict between, you know, the things that you learn as a Malay, being brought up in Malaysia, or it could be anywhere, in Pakistan or Morocco, or this applies to everybody. All of us, of course, we learn Islam from our parents. Most of us did not sit down and we did not learn Islam from a sheikh and from reading uh, the Quran and from studying the hadith directly. Most of us did not uh, get our knowledge of Islam that way. Most of us learned Islam by habit. And by the way, this is not a bad thing. Some of us, we think this is a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. This is mostly my children 
They have learned Islam by habit. And that, by the way, is purposeful from my part. You may be surprised. I don't sit down and give my kids lectures every day. Sit down, kids, in Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I don't. I, sometimes I, 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 I don't have a regular circle and it's on purpose. It's not, you know, just maybe it's laziness. But I don't think so. It's not. It's on purpose. Why? Because I want Islam to be something totally holistic for my children. It is something totally natural. It's something so normal and part of their normal everyday life. They don't look at it as something that is separate and, you know, there's a special time set aside for Islam. No. You live your life as a Muslim. Your life is a Muslim. It's something that happens to you all the time. It's just your state of being. This is a good thing from one angle. This is a good thing. Because then Islam, it is natural and it feels natural. But this has a downside. This has a problem. Of course, we parents are human beings. Our knowledge is limited. And many of us also learned our Islam from our parents. And we pick something here from this and we pick something there from that. And the other thing that has happened for most of us is that, and this is normal and natural as well, it's inevitable. How we interpret Islam to some extent is influenced by our environment. Even to the extent of some of the things that we consider is halal and haram. Let me give you an example. What would you think, what, 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 what do people think, in, I don't actually know, but uh, maybe this is not a good example. But if someone was to put the Qur'an on the floor, what would you think of that here in Malaysia? Would people consider this like an act of kufr to put the Qur'an on the floor? Would it surprise you if I told you that in the Masjid of the Prophet, the, the parchments and the blocks of wood that they used to write the Qur'an, they would pile it on the floor? Would that surprise you? What if I went walking into the masjid over here, the state, beautiful state masjid with my shoes? What would happen to me? Although, mashallah, in Malaysia they're very calm and, you know, they'd probably be polite, but in some places, I don't know, they might even kill you. Seriously. Would it surprise you if I told you the Prophet wasallam ordered people to pray with their shoes on and be different from Jews and Christians? Would that surprise you? And I'm not, by the way, saying go stomping into the masjid with your shoes on because we're going to oppose culture now, right? But what I'm trying to say is that what happens is our environment affects the way that we interpret things. Now, let me explain something to you. Dishonoring the Qur'an is most certainly an act of kufr. It's an act of disbelief. If you dishonor the Qur'an, that is an act of disbelief. But what is dishonoring? The concept of dishonoring will actually be different from one culture to another. So in one place, doing a particular action may not be considered dishonoring. Whereas in another culture, the same action will be considered as dishonoring. So you can do the same thing in two different places. One will consider it nothing and the other will consider it a type of abuse. Right? So naturally, Islam, to how you interpret Islam to some extent is going to be influenced by your culture. We can't, we can't avoid that. So this is what most of us are brought up with, right? Which is fine. Which is fine. It's fine as long as we only live in that culture. And the culture... And these cultural interpretations that we have are the only ones that we are really exposed to. But why does this all become a massive challenge in today's world? It all becomes a massive challenge in today's world. Because like I said, you know, we're living now, we're talking about 20 years ago. Because the idea of a Malay culture and a Malay Islam and a, you know, Moroccan culture, Moroccan Islam and a, you know, even now the government in England wants to have British Islam, right? I mean, obviously they want to do that for their own political, ideological reasons, but you know, and it will happen, as I said, it's inevitably, there will, if Muslims live in England long enough, there will be something British Islam, but these 
local, national, almost tribalistic interpretations are becoming more and more irrelevant in today's world. And actually, I think the, the modern world is one of the very reasons we can even stand here and have this discussion and think about this issue. Because now, now we live in the global village. Now we have a worldwide culture. We have a culture that permeates almost every single corner of this planet. And that culture is really connected to this, not this particular phone, yeah? And nor am I promoting Apple products, yeah? But it's a lot to do with this. Because at the clip, I, I flew from Manchester to Istanbul on my way here. So I stopped off in Istanbul uh, airport. And I'm there getting some food and a guy comes up to me. He says, oh, Abdurrahim, I watch your YouTube videos. Good, I really like them. I mean, in Turkey. I mean, why? I, you, you have to think. And, and that's what happens to me. I go all over the world and people recognize me and people know me. They know it because of this. Right? This is a global culture. What is happening in the world today is there is a global culture. And this means, brothers and sisters, that there is a mentality, there is a way of thinking. Because what is culture? What is, this is a good question, right? What is culture? Well, culture is basically what you do. Culture is what you do. Whatever you do, that's your culture. I know it sounds too simple, but really when you examine it and you study culture, that's what culture comes down to, what you do. And traditionally, of course, culture is influenced by geography. The way you dress generally is influenced by the climate, yes? I remember when I came to Malaysia, first time I came to Malaysia, I think it was the, yeah, the first time I came to Malaysia, um, 20 something years ago, I walked around everywhere in a sarong. Yes, yes. And I remember I was walking on the street and this guy, this street vendor, he grabs me, he puts his hand here, pulls it, he's all good, good. Me meaning you tied it right, yeah? That's what he was saying. Now, the interesting thing was, is that I'm walking around in a sarong, which is the traditional dress. The traditional, extremely comfortable dress, right? Now, today, we wear trousers and pants in Malaysia. It's hot in this country. There's a reason for 2,000 years, 3,000 years, 4,000 years, people wore a sarong. There's a reason. Right? Because it's comfortable in the heat. Now, I went then to the Islamic University, yeah? And I wanted to go and visit the university. They wouldn't let me in. Why? Because I was wearing a song. They said, you can't come in dressed like that. I was outraged. I said, well, how do you want me to dress? Office dress. Shirt and pants. I said, but this is how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to dress. Are you telling me if Rasulullah came here, you wouldn't let him in because he's wearing a sarong? And then I realized, actually, the king wears a sarong. No, he's different. I know he's different. <laughs> but I was, you know, I was really upset. You know, they were so polite. No, you know, I think they were shocked. This white man's going crazy. <laughs> they were, no, no, please, you have to understand. And, you know, I was still so angry, you know. Uh, but the point is, but culture has changed, right? But traditionally, culture, the food you eat, it comes from the environment, what is grown locally, your local products, the pro produce, the local food, what is available, right? So this is what makes culture. These things make culture. And some of the people's culture, uh, by the way, sometimes culture is, it's, it's, it's the mechanisms that people develop to survive. To survive, right? So these things have been in the past very, very important. They kept societies together, they kept people together. 
right? They stopped everything falling to bits. The culture that people developed is those systems that people develop to try and hold society together and keep it ordered. So now when something comes along and challenges that culture, people feel often, some people feel, that their very existence and the, in fact the stability of their society is being challenged. And this obviously has happened in many countries. But the thing what is happening here in many unfortunate, I think now alhamdulillah the ulama, you know the governments, they're catching up, they're realizing that you know this idea of preserving a local form of you know, religion and even the whole idea of nationalism is becoming less and less relevant in our global world because people have access. And 20 years ago, we couldn't have held a conference like this. Some of you who are old enough, you will know, it would have been impossible to hold a conference like this in, in Kuala Lumpur 20 years ago. powerfully vivid, spiritually uplifting, heart softening, life changing, soul transforming descriptions of life after death. We reminded ourselves about the barrier that is placed. So once you leave this world, a barrier is placed behind you and you are prevented from coming back to this life. Those two rak'ahs that you used to pray, you used to take for granted. After you leave this world, there's a barrier the journey of the soul through the stages of the day of resurrection and the explicit descriptions of hellfire as well as the beautiful and spiritually uplifting descriptions of paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we did not create the heavens and the earth without purpose, without aim, without reason. This is the assumption of those who disbelieve. So beware and low to those who disbelieve from the hellfire. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us immediately the example of the righteous people on the Day of Judgment. So he says, Ala inna awliya Allahi la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, No doubt, verily, the awliya of Allah, the friends of Allah, those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no fear on them. Things have changed. And you have, I mean, there is just common sense. What is the point in trying to stop certain things and prevent certain things when all a person needs to do is with a click of a button, they can access anyone saying anything anywhere. Anyone saying anything anywhere. This now, this now is a new culture. This is a new culture. You have to understand. Now we want to think about, brothers and sisters, the culture of this. The culture of this. How much of this, the culture of this, is compatible with Islam? I know many of you are hoping to me to give a long lecture on, you know, Malaysia and Malaysian culture and is it compatible with Islam? I think that's 20 years old. 10 years old. Today we need, because that's, that's already on its way out. It was out when someone told me, I can't go to the Malaysian Islamic University except I'm wearing trousers and pants. The global culture had already overtaken the minds of people and the habits of people and the behavior of people. 20 years ago, now it is different. This is the culture. And what is this culture? Are you, you, if you've listened to my lectures, you know, you already know what's coming. This, this actually represents fundamentally the culture of consumerism. This, unfortunately, brothers and sisters, at the moment, 
predominantly, and it's just a tool, of course, it can be used for lots of different things. But right now, predominantly at the moment, this is being used to manipulate you. To make you not into thinking people, but to make you into unthinking people. How many of the things that you buy when you go shopping, I wonder how much do you really think about it? How deeply do you think about the things that you do? Or how often do we just act upon our feelings? And really, if you think about it, brothers and sisters, this is what we are getting from this. The idea that you should follow your feelings, follow your desires, follow your dream, follow your passion. It's very little about duty, obligation, self-control, self-discipline. Follow your dream, follow your passion. If you feel like it, just do it. Yeah? Buy this, buy that, have this, have that. The successful person. Who is the successful person? The successful person is the one who has a nice car, has a nice condominium, a nice house, has this thing and that thing. Success is married by, success is measured by your job, your wealth, your position in society. This is success. Please, brothers and sisters, do you think that this is the Islamic definition of success? When the Mu'addin calls, Hayya ala al is he saying, come here, I will teach you business, I will teach you how to buy a nice car, how to get a good house, that's what you need to come to, is that what he's saying? When he says, Hayya ala al is that what falah, success means? No. Absolutely not. But this is how we measure it. Even the best of us, believe me, even the most religious of us, we are taken in. We are taken in. I'll be honest. Am I happy with my iPhone 5C? No. I see Dr. Salah. Dr. Muhammad Salah with his iPhone for 6. Look at his big screen. And his fast processor. I still have this chunky, clunky thing, you know? Subhanallah. This is how we've become. This is how we measure success. How many followers do you have on Facebook? MashaAllah, Abdurrahim, 600, and I'll just tell you, you know, 670,000. SubhanAllah, MashaAllah, Sheikh. Can you post this for me, please? This is the new culture. I came off the aeroplane, and alhamdulillah, the brothers, the volunteers, may Allah bless the volunteers for this amazing conference. May Allah make, we should all, SubhanAllah, make lots of dua for them. You know, we come here, we enjoy the event, you know, we go. They've been working, I don't know how many months beforehand. They sent me an email, I don't know how long ago, three, four months ago. That's organization, yeah. So it started even before then. And it will keep going after you've gone home and you're relaxing. The volunteers will still be, you know, finishing everything off and tidying up. And so may Allah bless them. So we were sitting, there was a dinner for the volunteers and the chefs were sitting there. And I arrived, you know, all the chefs like this. Assalamu alaikum Abdurrahim. What's I said, what's this? It's the only uh, she, uh, uh, Sheikh Ismail Mufti Menke gets up. Give, let me give you a hug, mashallah. Maybe he's got an old phone. Maybe it's... <laughs> he needs to upgrade. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But you know, we can laugh. Of course, the Sheikhs, I am sure they're doing very important things. You know, they are not looking at, you know, Kim Kardashian, you know, her, her latest outfit or her latest lack of outfit, you know. You know, alhamdulillah, they're posting good things and, you know, giving uh, nasiha, answering questions about Islam. Of course, it's a tool, brothers and sisters, it's a tool. This can be used for amazingly good things and amazingly bad things. It's a tool, right? But the fact is, we have to understand that this tool is influencing it's become our new culture. 
It's become our new culture. Now, a brother was asking me just now as he's dropping me off uh, from the hotel. He's telling me, you know, atheism amongst Muslims is a big problem. Atheism. And it is. It's a big problem. There's a big problem with Muslims apostatizing. And if you think these are just ignorant people, no. You know, I don't want to put some doubts in your heart, but I will explain. This is sometimes even people who have memorized Quran, who have been studying with ulama. People are leaving Islam. They are full of doubts. And the reason is, they have access. And certainly, I will tell you the truth, there is some stuff out there when you read it, and you hear it, and you look at it, it will shock you to the core. You think, Islam? This is Islam? Does Islam say this? Does Islam say that? And the problem is, brothers and sisters, we are taken in and manipulated because in reality, we are not deep thinkers. We don't think deeply, we don't understand deeply, we are not self-reflective. Personally, I believe that most atheists, atheism in most, I don't say every case, I don't say every case, sometimes people become atheists or they leave Islam sometimes out of what is for them at that time a genuine intellectual Conviction, but for most people, believe me, 90%, maybe more, I can't give you an exact statistic, it is only emotional. It is an emotional decision. It's not an intellectual decision. And the reason is, I believe, is simply because the global culture is a culture of following your nafs. And doesn't Allah say in the Quran, the meaning of which is, have you not seen the one who takes their nafs as their Allah, as their God, they take their desires. Haven't you seen, how can you take your desire as a God? How can you take your desire as a God, as an Allah, as an equal, an arrival to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How? How do you do that? Think about that. You think about it. What does that mean? Maybe you think that worshipping an idol only means when people build a statue and they pray to it. That's not the only shirk. That's not the only idol worship. That's not the only God. Woe be to the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham, the Prophet ﷺ said. How do you worship money? How? What, you put a, uh, you know, a ringgit you know, on the shelf and you say, oh, ringgit, oh, you say, offer it. No. You know that's not what it means. Worshipping money, when you become a money worshipper, it means what we said previously. When you think that money is what makes you happy and you think it what, it's what gives you success and when you have it, you're happy and when you don't have it, you're sad. And I don't mean on the subsistence level. Of course, everyone who is hungry from day to day and starving and has no roof over their head, that, that of course is just a natural type of fear. But I'm talking about on a different level. You have food, you have clothing, you have, there's no insecurity in your life in reality. But no, no, it's all about the money. How much money, money, money can I get? If I have it, I'm happy. If I don't, this, now you, you can understand. This is your God. As if this controls everything for you. Your desires again, the worship of the desires. The one who always wants to satisfy their passion, satisfy their desires. And this is exactly, by the way, what this technology and those who control it, this is what they want us to be consumers. They want us to buy they want us to believe that happiness comes from having those things that they have to offer us. And they will do everything they can to manipulate us. It's a science. If you want to be shocked at, to the extent to which and the money to which they spend, and you want to research this topic, I recommend you read a book called Brandwashed. Yeah, brand, you know Brainwashed? Brandwashed. It's very readable. It's not like a difficult book to read. And this man, he talks about how, and millions and millions are spent, even to the extent, brothers and sisters, that they will scan people's brains. It costs, you know, like thousands of pounds a session. Thousands and thousands a session. They will scan people's brains when they are involved in activities. Let me tell you something. 
yeah, what they found out about the iPhone in particular, the iPhone, not every mobile phone, the iPhone, what they found out is that when people use an iPhone, the part of their brain that lights up is the same part of your brain that lights up when you are having a religious experience. And believe me, it is designed like that. It is designed to replace religion, to make this your Allah, to make this your God, to make this your deen. Think about it, brothers and sisters. Think about it. This is the challenge. The challenge, this is the challenge. Believe me, I think if we are talking about the challenge of, you know, our traditional cultures versus, you know, just, you know, understanding the Quran and Sunnah, I think this is, it still exists, but it's not the, the major challenge for us today. The major challenge for us is how do we deal with this new technology? How do we deal with this new global culture? So now the atheist. You see, atheism is so convenient. If you don't believe in God, then you don't need to believe in rules because we're all just animals. We just follow our desires. We follow our instincts. I don't need any religion to tell me what's right and what's wrong, what I can and what I can't do. Who is anyone to tell me what I can and what I can't do? I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to believe what I want to believe. No one is going to tell me what to do and what to believe. You see, most people, brothers and sisters, and by the way, this may apply to most of you, and this applies to all cultural, whether it's global culture, national culture, tribal culture. Most of us, this is how we are. Most people hate to think that they are doing something bad or wrong. We don't like it. We don't like to think that we are doing something bad or wrong. So let me give you an example of something that might be controversial, probably not in this hall today, but I'm sure you will recognize this is super controversial. Music. Yeah? Is music halal or haram? Right? Now, I say it's controversial, but believe me, in the time of the imams, the imams of sunnah, and I mean Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, these are the four famous imams. It's not, it was not controversial. It was not controversial. Music was haram. There was no controversy about it whatsoever. In fact, I, I challenge anyone to go back to the early writings of the four madhahib and find any of the scholars, including the four imams themselves and their students, who held an opinion other than music, musical instruments, was haram. Find it for me. Tell me. Please, because, you know, I would like to know. If there is a genuine opinion from the early days of Islam, I would be very interested. So where has this come from? How did it become something, become controversial? Even subhanAllah in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he mentioned that people from my ummah, one of the things he mentioned, they will make halal musical instruments. The drinking of wine and the wearing of silk. The wearing of silk for men, by the way, not for women. Right? So subhanAllah. So now, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Most people prefer, they prefer to find a loophole. To find some way to make this haram thing halal. Yes, but this scholar and that scholar and you know, most of the Muslims and why are you going against the tide? You're a fanatic. No, who says this these days? And you know, they will think of everything they can to make it halal for themselves. To try and find, for, because they don't want to feel, people don't want to feel that I'm doing something haram. I'm doing an act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, really in reality, the attitude of a Muslim, and no one is going to be free from doing haram. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the son of Adam sins by night and day. The son of Adam sins by night and by day. We will commit sins. It's inevitable you will commit sins. But the best of the sons of Adam are those who make tawbah, who make repentance. So this is the attitude of the believer. The attitude of the believer is, I have done something wrong. I have disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah forgive me. Allah guide me. And this is the difference between Adam alayhi salam and shaitan. 
Look how shaitan behaved when he disobeyed Allah. What did he do? Made excuses. How can you tell me to bow down to something that's made of clay and I'm made of fire? He's saying to Allah. He's coming with excuses. Because you misguided me, shaitan is saying to Allah, as if he's accusing Allah of misguiding him. So this is how we are. Most people, unfortunately, this is what we do. We'll try to find a way to make it halal. Riba, music, whatever thing our nafs we're following. This is not how the believer should be. This is not the way of a deep thinking person. This is not the way of a person who knows themselves and understands their nafs and thinks about why do I do what I do and why do I think what I think and why do I behave the way that I behave. This goes back to the beginning of my talk. You need to be self-reflective. You need to understand yourself. You need to understand what motivates you, why you do what you do. But for most people, I, that's it. There, I don't want. That's why atheism is so convenient. And now it's easy for them to say, yes, science. So most scientists are atheists. And all of these things, they will justify it. But at the bottom end of this and the end of this is only I just want to follow my nafs. And what's the proof? If they were really sincere, when they started reading all of these things and these shubahat came to their mind, they would have gone and asked. They would have gone and found people who could answer the questions. You find most of them, they don't do that. Some problem, some difficulty comes, life is not so easy anymore, they switch.